Okay, thanks everyone. And thanks for last week, Emily, for taking over, or last month, taking over when I was having so many difficulties. Problem. Uh, hopefully this will work. So let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, and we'll start with roll call. Okay. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Elson? Here. Commissioner Miles? Present. Commissioner Phipps? Here. Commissioner Ravazio? Here. Commissioner McPherson? That's you, Lucy. <laughs> oh. Oh, she's muted. Not okay. Uh, yeah, you just muted yourself, but now you're good. All right, um, and Commission Vice Chair Janowski. Here. And Chair Blomberg. Okay, let's try this again. I'm present. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so our first item is to open the floor for public comment if there's anything that's not on our existing agenda. So if we have any emails or anyone in the public who's raising a hand, they can speak now. Um, while we're checking for raised hands, I was forwarded an item for public comment um, and I will go ahead and read that, but I'll just turn my timer on. Um, this comment says, hi, Ashley and Emily. In general, things have been better with the dogs off leash in the park, but if the town is paying for enforcement, then I wanted to make sure you received some data points. The added enforcement should try to extend to the edges of the park. This couple and their three dogs are often here in the late afternoon. Also, I included a video that was ironic, the police sitting in their car while a woman threw her dog the ball. We are seeing a lot of off leash dog traffic on the East Canal path behind the homes on Mohawk. Some enforcement may be needed here as well. Um, and that is it and it's signed Jolie DeVilbus. This uh, email was just received, so it hasn't been uploaded to the website yet. And it does include pictures and we will include the pictures with the uh, late, late correspondence received when we re-upload that to the website. Okay, thank you. There's nothing else we can move on to the agenda. And the first item is 3A in presentations, the introduction of Rec Inc. from Aaron Duggan, who I see is on, our Park and Rec coordinator. Yes, and I'm gonna do just a brief intro for Erin. Um, like you said, Erin is our recreation coordinator and she's been working with Rec Inc. and adults with developmental disabilities for many, many years. And she can get into that a little bit more. Um, but she's giving you a presentation today because with the consent of Todd and Rebecca, uh, the town and our, our department specifically is gonna be taking over these services and providing programming for this specific um, this specific group. So again, uh, adults with de developmental disabilities, this program used to be hosted through Larkspur, but they're moving away from doing any programming right now um, due to the pandemic and reduced staff. So we are absorbing that and we are very excited to hear what Erin has to say. And I wanted to just reintroduce this, this group of um, individuals and participants and the association with Rec Inc. I know she's given presentations in the past. So welcome Erin. Thank you. Um, let's see. So I share, let me. Yes, you click share, you click on the window you want to share and then you click share. Right, I'm just getting it ready. Sorry. Okay, there we go. Nope, failed, come on. Ah, oh, that's so unfair. Let's see. Hmm. All right, let me try something else. <sighs> Let me try making you a co-host in case that makes a difference. Okay. No co-host. I think it's because I started the presentation. Uh, let's see. I can also pull it up on mine if you have trouble. All right. Let me um, try this. Ah. Okay. Well, that's just lovely. <laughs> hmm. Try and show. 
let's try this. Now, aha, do you see it? Yes. Okay, let me try this thing. There we go. So now hopefully you see a picture of a lot of them sitting there. Is that right? Are we good? Okay. Um, so Rec Inc. is a 501c3 that's a booster organization. Its mission is to bring the maximum number of people with developmental disabilities into recreational activities, local events, and philanthropic services, thereby allowing them to find a place in the larger community. In 2019, uh, Rec Inc. served 180 adults with developmental disabilities through the city of Larkspur. We saw 50 adult volunteers from the community and 350 teen volunteers. Uh, we began with 15 programs, but we've pared it down to a very manageable nine. The majority of the volunteers come from Corte Madera and Larkspur. Students from Hall Middle School, Redwood, Kent, and Marin Catholic fulfill their community service requirements through us. Those 400 volunteers last year provided 2,236 hours of community service in our nine programs. So now I'm just gonna quickly go through those nine programs. This is the Champion Lions Club. It's its own 501c3, just as every Lions Club is. Uh, we use it for the Rec Inc. as an advisory board. We have 25 members. In 2009, the Lions Club International sent a film crew out and spent thousands and thousands of dollars shooting a video about the club and the programs that they oversee. This is the third Friday dance, and it usually gets between 70 and 120 clients every month. Um, the dance was actually started when I was an intern for the city of Corte Madera. Uh, when the clients come, the, they and the volunteers can do dancing, shoot hoops, play beach ball, volleyball. There's art stations, selfie stations, and of course we run them through the regular dances like the YMCA, the cha-cha slide, limbo, the stroll, and more. Every month the dances are themed. The clients voted on these, and these are the most popular dances that we have. Um, the bunny dance, they love that. And then there's the Halloween dance, and as you can see, they come decked to the nines for that. And also they have a prom. They'd been lamenting for years about not going to their prom or having a horrible time at their prom. So we created this spectacular event for them. Um, the high schoolers also love it because they get to double wear their prom outfits. <laughs> Our biggest dance every year is the holiday dance. And we get anywhere, we've mm, about 180 to 200 people come to that. This is sports night and it's run by two Corte Madera residents, Dave Hers and his wife. Um, we have, they get to play three different sports every night with the volunteers. So we have giant badminton, big bowling, monster volleyball, wiffle ball and hockey. Basketball is another very popular program with the volunteers. Um, we have a, we have 20 adults with disabilities and we play them against teams from the communities, um, the high schools, the police and fire department, different community groups, and anybody who's interested and wants to play from the public. Volunteers find this event very healing and uplifting. And that's basically because our clients are, well, they're just, they do very unexpected things. They're very open, they're kind, they're loving, and they are very, very funny. Uh, Robin Williams came several times and the year of his death, he, he came and he sought the solace and comfort with his friends and family, he'd bring them with him. Uh, pretty much anybody who goes to this event doesn't expect to have it be so meaningful, but it touches everyone who comes. We also have a Be Healthy class and that's modeled after Weight Watchers. It's taught by Dixie James, who is a Weight Watcher instructor and she's also a retired special ed teacher. Then we have party night. Um, it's a smaller event. The dance has so many people, but a lot of the clients want something smaller and intimate. So this is a great place for them to bring a date 
or their friends or to meet new friends. And of course we have our world beat dance class. Um, that's a good one for people who love music, dance and just want another chance to be social. We also do a movie night mall night once a month at the Northgate Mall and that's run through the Lions Club. In a three and a half hour window, the volunteers help the clients to read about the movies, choose a film, get dinner, run around the mall, um, as well as get to the correct theater, which is a really big problem, and meet their rides all before 7.30 p.m. We also have been striving to create more community events, uh, a chance for the community to be introduced and hang out with these people. So last year we partnered with the Lark Theater to produce two themed sold out events. Um, we had planned four for this year, but COVID has rather shut us down. Uh, for our polar event sing-along movie night, just like in the real movie, um, we served free hot chocolate and cookies and everyone came in their pajamas and holiday garb. And at the very end of the movie, the Lark Theater made it snow inside was spectacular. For, for the RecInc programs, RecInc provides these services. It serves in an advisory capacity for program needs and development. It purchases almost all of the equipment and supplies. It assists in client management and it currently handles the volunteer signup system. They also help supervise programs when needed and it provides financial assistance discounts, lines dues for mentors, scholarships, et cetera. And of course it manages the wrecking finances and the 501c3 status. The recreation department in turn provides sustaining the communication and collaboration with 34 agencies, parents and caregivers. Um, these are the things that I did when I was at Larkspur and I would continue to do here in Corte Madera. Run the large programs and events that have high community participation manage the volunteer program, which is to train, supervise, and oversee the Marin Catholic 50-hour project students. I would continue to do the marketing, which is simply to send out the email blast to 300 people on our list and coordinate the annual mailing to 600. We would continue to use the Champion Lions Club for feedback and guidance and continue to create events that would promote community participation. And of course, we would continue to work with Hall Middle School to provide them with monthly volunteer opportunities. Currently, we have one to two Zoom classes a week, plus a program called Check-In and Chat. And that's where we pair 20 of the clients with volunteers or, and families. Um, this Friday, a group of 20 agency members are going to show up at a meeting that I've requested. They're promising to take on a more active role in helping these programs go on. It's my hope that you'll be happy with these programs. Um, they're very important to the community and, oh my goodness, it's hiding. Um, they touch the lives of hundreds of volunteers. So it's, it's just a wonderful program and I, I hope you'll be proud to sponsor it or house it, I should say. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thanks so much, Erin. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I have uh, one question. It's a fantastic program. So touching the work that you do. Um, you were talking about the 20 volunteers that you're asking to come in to take a more active role. Can you just expand on that a little bit, what you're hoping to get um, from that expanded interaction? And is that specifically because of COVID and the quarantine or is it um, something separate? Thank you. It's in general. Sure. That's a great question. Um, originally, uh, we had we usually work with about 35 agencies. And originally they would come once a month, some of them, and we would have this meeting and they would listen to what I had to offer and they would go back to their clients and tell all the clients. Well, after we got all the programs situated and working that, that kind of fell off the plate. I mean, once a month was way too much, but then they just faded away and let us work our little twishes off. But the problem was, is we really need them to step back in um, so, that, uh, so that we're not working so hard to get the clients to our programs. Because now we have a booming 
uh, volunteer program. Um, and we really need just to let the clients know again, they, their staff turnover is so high. So they're coming together to do that. And um, we're hoping that we can, a few of them will step up and take charge of some of the programs as, as they always do, you know, like the HERS from Corte Madera. The programs are primarily run by volunteers. Um, so we just wanna keep that going. And instead of meeting every month, we're just asking them to come three times a year to a Zoom meeting and continue with, the, you know, I, I send out the monthly uh, agenda. So we're just hoping that they will be more proactive. And now that the programs all got cut from Larkspur, they're extremely motivated because I had been asking them to do this for the last few years and I was getting a lukewarm response and right off the bat, I've got 20 coming. So pretty happy with that. I have a question. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by bringing it to Corte Madera? How uh, are you know, planning to use the recreation center and how and when, and uh, just wondering what the plans are there? Well, I'm working with um, Ashley. We're hoping that Larkspur will still allow us to uh, use the Hall Middle School gym since it is in the Larkspur Corte Madera School District. Um, and they do have a community room where we've tent we, where we've been meeting for some of the programs. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue doing that. We had used in the past year or two uh, the Neil Cummins gym, mm -hmm. and we've used the community center. Of course, the dances started in the community center under Jackie Branch, and they had been there for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm hoping that we can stay where we've been planted because change for the clients is I so see. hard. Okay. Um, but if we, I've heard that portables may be in our future, so maybe to have a few things there would be fine. They do love Thank the you. Puerto Madera Center, so there you go. Thanks. Thank you. To jump in a little bit is, is one part of the bringing it to Puerto Madera part is that um, there has been um, a shared reimbursement for Aaron's time right now between Larkspur and Corte Madeira. So now it's all on Corte Madeira to support Aaron for the time, the, this very small amount of time she spends planning and programming um, every week. So we're, we're hosting it. That's fine. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? And Ashley, is there anything that we need to do as far as um, voting or anything like that? Nope, just hear and receive. And if you had any um, concerns that we should be aware of or reasons why we shouldn't be supporting this program, that would be what we were looking for direction. So no real direction unless you there was something that stood out to you that we hadn't seen. Okay, yeah. I've, since I've been on the commission, I've gotten a couple other similar updates about the program and. I feel like it's just been so universally supported. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we should probably check and see if there's any public comment on the presentation. Yeah, please. Um, I am not seeing any raised hands though, and I did not receive any emails regarding the topic. Okay. Thank you, Erin, for the presentation and thanks for all your work on this. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So the next item is item four for uh, the consent calendar. It's the approval of the draft minutes of the September 28th, 2020 commission meeting. Um, if you re review those, um, let me know if anyone has any comments or corrections. And, and if not, you can have a motion to approve those minutes. I make a motion to approve, no edits. Is there a second to approve those? I'll second. second. Okay, so please mark the September 28th, 2020 minutes as approved. And um, item five is business items. Um, 5A is discussion and possible direction to staff regarding a winter 2021 operational plan for the dog, dog park. Yes, there's been some um, public questioning on if we have a plan for the dog park uh, since the opening in June of this year. Uh, with quick use and lots of traffic going in and out of the dog park, the area of grass just inside the gate um, died off quickly. Um, so there's been questions about what that would lead to when the, um, the bare soil is added to water and 
what we might be planning. So that brings me to the recommendation and uh, that's to discuss community concerns regarding the condition of the ground surfacing inside the entry gate to town bark with the potential impact of rain and provide possible direction to staff regarding a winter 2021 operational plan for that area. Consider one, directing staff to apply mulch to that area as a temporary solution to absorbing standing water and minimizing uh, mud for the winter season. Two, close the park area after the first rain and reopen it after a specified length of time to allow the area to dry out. Three, close portions of the dog park to allow grass regrowth and soil drainage. Four, keep the park open as is. And five, request more information and related costs for installing synthetic turf in the area after spring 2021. Or six, provide any additional direction as needed. So just a little bit of background, as I mentioned, uh, the park you are all aware that opened in June of this year, one of our um, positive things during COVID is to open that area. Uh, but in preparation for rain, uh, we have a couple of different options to consider. And I kind of went through each of those options that I outlined and gave a little bit more background on each one of those. Um, and first, the suggestion to apply mulch to the impacted area is the most cost-effective solution that would allow the park to remain open during the rainy months rather than close it down. And then mulch is, is currently used at dog parks in Sausalito and Novato and requires minimal staff and maintenance. So I just wanted to give you kind of some um, something to consider that our neighbors are already using and it's very common practice. But you know, people that utilize the dog areas, some people are very for or against mulch. So that's something to consider. The second option is closing the dog park during the rainy months, which is a less desirable option for dog owners, and it but it would preserve the area and reduce maintenance prior to reopening the park after rains conclude. And one concern voiced by council member Lee that I'd like to note in an email to staff is the town has created a community amenity and social gathering space that will want to spill back out into the park if the gates are locked. Given the recent issues with the dogs in the wider um, park areas, um, council member Lee has a deep concern that um, just as we have gotten the larger complaints under control, it will have a second peak this winter. And then a third solution is possibly um, a compromise to consider sectioning off areas. And that's something that, um, that our public works director, RJ, has discussed is something that he thought would be a regular maintenance. And that's also um, very common in our industry to kind of section off areas to allow regrowth. So you don't have to close down the whole area, but you would have different areas. So it's kind of a a compromise for to consider it. Um, the last alternative would create more staff work related to maintenance and signage, but it would allow the community to continue to use it. The fourth option is to keep the dog park open as is, which is not recommended by staff. Keeping the park open without addressing the possibility of standing water from its rains could result in health concerns mentioned by a dog owner, John Davis, in an early email once the dog park reopened. And according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, one bacterial disease that can be contracted by um, humans or animals exposed to water that has been mixed with animal waste is uh, lep leptospirosis. I can't remember how to pronounce it exactly, but there's a link to it and you can learn as much as you want about it. Um, and the fifth option is to request that staff provide more information related to costs for installing synthetic turf in the park area, just in that one area after spring 2021 when the rains uh, conclude. And staff suggest this solution as a long-term consideration that will require budget planning. Um, Public Works Director RJ estimated that synthetic turf averages about $10 to $14 per square foot uh, to install and also typically requires installation of three inches of aggregate base and another inch of decomposed granite. So there's a lot more maintenance to getting that going as well as a cost associated with it. And there's no fiscal impact unless you wanna do mulch and I am happy to um, provide a budget or if you want to provide direction for us to pursue that. Um, if mulch is requested, uh, RJ estimated an average cost of $35 to $55 per cubic yard and it's, and it's poured in about two inches thick. And again, it would just be to that one area that we're anticipating standing water. Well, thank you, Ashley, for all the research you've done on it. That's really helpful for us to talk about it. I, I think um, now that we have the park, it would be helpful if we can try to keep it open if possible. And you've suggested things like fencing off areas that are especially muddy or using bark or mulch near the entrance. And I think we can generally trust park maintenance crews to do those things um, as needed. We also don't know how much it's gonna rain this winter. It is a La Nina year. Um, so I would suggest that those are our basic considerations that we would like to keep it open if we could and we have some methods to do that. Any comments from anyone? 
I agree with Nate. Definitely. I think we, we've got to try to keep it open. I mean, it's so popular. People love, I've been to the dog park a lot. People love it. It's, it's mm -hmm. used, it's enjoyed. Um, hopefully we're getting people, you know, and to keep their dogs in the dog park instead of off leash in the park. So, um, I would support, you know, either, you know, the lowest maintenance kind of cheapest, like maybe we try the mulch and see if that works and that could be a first step. And then if it didn't, then maybe fencing off a little area, but I would definitely really hope that we could keep it open. And like Nate said, I mean, we might not get much rain. I agree. I agree with both of you. I think we ought to, you know, mulch is the line of first defense. And then if it gets really bad, kind of cordon off certain areas with that, like that orange fencing or something to, is that what you would do? Um, yeah, I, I have totally. A good question. Yeah. Can this see? Can this see? Um, my quick question is: Could we um, take more than one course of action? For example, um, look into researching about mulch and um, adding synthetic turf instead of just focusing on one, because we don't know. About the outcome um, and we could take more than one recommended action. You're breaking up a little bit, Lucy, but yes, um, you the commission is welcome to give more than one direction of the options. Yeah, I agree that it, if it turns out that the mulch is not ineffective or even in a normal rain year, it's, it's a mess right there at the entrance. Um, we should definitely look at what the next option would be like synthetic turf. Um, I'm open to anything, but I would suggest that we see how things go because we haven't seen a winter yet in this area with dog park use um, and keep that in our back pocket. That would be my suggestion. I agree. I mean, you know, lepto is a really very, it can be fatal for dogs. So definitely we do not want to have standing water. So, but I think if we could try bark and then, you know, that might be the easiest, cheapest at least first approach. So I think to the, if, if there's not other comments to the extent that we have a recommendation, it would be the overarching recommendation would be to attempt to keep the dog park open this winter. And um, that would be using multiple methods um, like fencing and bark or mulch to prevent mud or standing water at the park staff's discretion. And then of course we'll be meeting monthly and we can hear back on how it's going or I'm sure some of us will be out there so we can see it as well. Uh, we do need to open it up for public comment first before we right. wrap up the discussion. Okay. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Okay, anything from the public um, on the call or via email? There are no raised hands and no emails were received. Okay. Um, then I would suggest that we move to recommend that we attempt to keep the dog park open for the winter, um, minimizing mud and standing water by using bark, mulch, or fencing as needed at park staff's discretion. Is that decent wording for what we just discussed? Sounds good to me. Direction noted. And does that suffice? Do we need to vote or is that sufficient direction for, for Ashley to move forward? I feel like that's probably sufficient. I think that's fine. I mean, yes, the, the action requested on the agenda was direction to staff. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for all your work on that. And really happy that it's working out in general and that people are really getting behind it and using it, that's great. And so moving on to business item, the second business item 5B, which is discussion and possible action and direction to staff regarding a park sign template. I think that would be like a standardized sign type that we would use park-wide. 
Yes, thank you. Um, specifically considering um, our park signs, our entry signs, so the name of the park and then adding, say, an open uh, sunrise to sunset is what I'm proposing. And proposing um, a template, a unified template going forward, uh, much modeled after the re most recent sign that was put in at Old Puerto Madera Square. And it was brought to my attention at our department head directors meeting uh, today that this would be, when we need to change it. So if the commission would like to see this pursued, then you would need to make a recommendation to council um, to consider that as well. It does need to go to council if it's gonna be signage. Um, so first my recommendation is review and discuss the proposed template for park science and consider one, approving the proposed template for future park science and permit staff to make the final decisions related to dimensions and materials spe specific to each location or to provide any additional direction as needed. And discussions following the approval of the sign at Old Corte Madera Square in February 24th commission meeting, staff and commission have expressed the desire for park science to have a unified look. And based on the design created for the Old Corte Madera Square by Allison Bricker, staff suggests approving the design as a template for future park signs. Staff notes that the egret is the design connection to the town logo. Uh, but otherwise, the old Corte Madera Square sign does, um, doesn't list the town, so something to consider if the commission would like to have um, the town of Corte Madera listed on the signs. So in the example that I had in the attachment, I do have both versions for you to kind of look at. And again, it's just the template based on that sign, so if it's something that the commission would like to pursue or um, hold for further discussion, um, let me know. Uh, the two parks that are in current need of entrance signs are the Cove Park and Skunk Hollow Mini Park. And staff recommends the commission consider one, approving the proposed template for future park science and permit staff to make final decisions related to the dimensions and materials spe specific to each location or provide additional direction as needed. So have other commissioners had a chance to look at the agenda and scroll down and see those sign types? Yep. I'm looking at those now. Um, would anybody want to Ashley to put them up so you can see them, or have you? Are you? Is everybody familiar? Well, I know I had a chance to look before, and I, I think it looks really nice. I do like the idea of adding adding the town of Corte Madera at the bottom. Um, I mean, I think it's obvious, but it's a nice touch for the branding. But I, I think they look really nice. I agree. It's really classy looking. I, I like them too. Um, one thing I would consider because I do like the idea of having Corte Madera in there. And right now, you know, town of Corte Madera looks really small. What about if over the name in a little bit smaller, it said Corte Madera Cove Park, Corte Madera Skunk Hollow. So we just have a little eyebrow in graphics is called the eyebrow. The eyebrow is Corte Madera and then followed by the park name. That might be a nice continuous way to put Corte Madera kind of a little bit more front and center. Why? Because I don't think you need town of Corte Madera. That sounds more official. If you put Corte Madera in the name itself, it sounds a little more, I don't know. Like it would say Carmel. I always think if, if it would work for Carmel, we should do it for Corte Madera. One thing to, to notice, just as you're talking, it made me think about it, is one, one reason why we'd want to have Town of Corn Madeira listed on any of our signs is that in case somebody from our community was wondering who they needed to call for a repair or a question, they would know who to call. Since we are lucky and fortunate that some of our HOAs have little mini parks, um, it mm -hmm. might uh, clarify some things. Okay, yeah, that makes sense too. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I do like adding town of Corte Madera. I think that looks really nice. I, I agree that it could be just a little bit bigger. It looks smaller, at least on this example. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I like, I like having a, um, you know, consistent signage and these look really nice. Allison did a great job. You know what's so ironic about Allison Bricker? She actually bought a house in Chapman Park that had been lived in by Donald Sutherland, who, as Jackie Branch knew, was a longtime volunteer who did graphic design and printing for the town of Corte Madera. So she lives in the same house and it actually had a printer shed. She actually can print too. She's got a little print shop there. So she's a great find. I'm glad she's working with us now. That's great. <clears throat> Good trivia. I didn't know that. <laughs> Just 
think of invasion of the body snatchers. It's like some things were just meant to be. I guess whoever lives in that house, I think the next buyer will have to sign on that they're the free graphics person for the tech. Like it. <laughs> so it sounds like we have all positive votes for um, having Porta Madera on the signs. Um, Pat suggested Porta Madera um, without the town of others like the town of Porta Madera at the bottom. Um, I, I uh, am hearing the reason for why you would want it to say town of Corte Madera so people know who owns the park. I, I'm fine with that. But I, okay. I agree. I agree. It should be bigger. It shouldn't look like just legal disclaimer copy. It should look, uh, you know, like it's part of the sign. Yeah, I think it would be worthwhile to have it bigger, too. So it doesn't just look like a little, you know, note at the end of the sign. What about okay. the position of that? Does everybody comfortable with it at the bottom, kind of as like a, the, the bottom line? Yeah, I think it looks nice there. Yeah. I, I think I'd look at just centering it underneath on the one that says the Cove Park, you know, open sunrise to sunset, town of Corte Madeira. I would, I would just center it. It just kind of looks weird over by the bird. I don't See, know. Yeah, I kind of think it ties into the bird a little bit. I, I okay. sort of like how it looks to the left. I, it is yeah, not, I it, is, it is, it is, it is not a, a big deal either way. Yeah. It looks great. I think it's a design decision. <laughs> yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever, whatever they, whatever design. Allison wants to do, but it looks good. But a little bigger, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, Ashley, you, you were asking if um, we were supportive of the designs shown in the agenda, and it sounds like we are. Um, possible exception of maybe slightly larger font for the town of Puerto Madera, but in general, deferring to that style of sign and discretion of the uh, of staff to get those things made. So again, the commission is is okay recommending this sign template going forward to uh, for council's final final approval. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And do we need public comment to check on public comment on that, Rebecca? Yes, public comment with every item. Um, but I will give people a moment to raise their hands. I'm not seeing any raised hands at the moment, and we did not receive um, any public comment emails regarding this item. And I'm still seeing no raised hands. Okay, thank you. So there's one more business item on the agenda, that's item 5C. Um, that's discussion and direction to staff regarding possible cancellation or rescheduling of November and December 2020 regular meetings of Park and Rec Commission, just due to the proximity of the holidays. Um, could you remind us what days those would fall on if we weren't to move them? Uh, yes. So um, current meetings are scheduled on Monday, November 23rd and December, Monday's December 28th of 2020. And one thing to note that I found out after um, producing this document is that the, the date that I proposed uh, possibly combining them for a special meeting on December 14th is also the scheduled flood board commission, flood board, is it Rebecca? It is and your chair also serves on that board. So there's nothing to say that we can't have two meetings in one day, but uh, Rebecca made a good note that maybe we could start earlier if that's the desired date. The reason why I chose that date um, is just around the holidays in December. December 7th is also Pearl Harbor Day. That's the Monday before that. And then the following two weeks we have holidays. So one possible option you're suggesting is that we could leave the meeting on Monday, November 23rd, and then change the meeting in December to the 14th, but at an earlier hour? Correct. So with that as a starting point for discussion, does anybody have any comments about whether you wanna have those meetings or if those times are all right? I think historically we have combined November and December. So I don't know, Ashley, unless we think that we have a whole bunch of stuff to cover. I mean, that would be my, if we don't think we do, then I think combining the one makes sense just with the hustle and bustle of the holidays. And for me, December 7th would work um, or December 14th. I just, I guess it depends if you think that we need to meet two times or if one would suffice. I think one in the middle would be good. I think if we've got anything coming up that needs to go to council that needs to have your um, review prior, I think that that could be done um, at just one of those meetings. 
And I think after learning about the, the flood board meeting date, I think December 7th would be a good date if anybody doesn't um, mind meeting on Pearl Harbor Memorial Day, Remembrance Day. Does anybody what about, what about, what about November 30th? Is, is November 30th a possibility? This, I'm, I'm, not, I'm away on the 7th, but the, the 14th only is good. difficulty with November 30th would be the packet would need to be produced uh, the week before when- Oh, which is Thanksgiving. Yeah, 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 no, um, no. But it just okay. depends. No, no, that's okay, got it. So perhaps an option would be to have a single combined meeting on December 14th, if we could start at five or 5.30. If a flood board meeting starts at 6.30. Right. If we have a, not a lot on the schedule, we could finish in an hour, perhaps, for this meeting. That works for me. <laughs> it's going to be a busy night for uh, the chair. <laughs> Nate's up for it. Yeah. I'm sorry, Nate, you said December 7th, right? 14th. 14th. So yeah. I don't know if this Hanukkah starts I believe December 10th this year. So that will be during Hanukkah. I don't know if that's something we should consider. I don't know, I just feel like we should be. Yeah. November and December is a tough one. <laughs> I know. It's, yeah. So we could do December 7th, but then Pat can't be there or we can do the 14th and it's, you know, during Hanukkah and there's the flood board at the same time. So they're probably not gonna be one perfect <laughs> date. You right. can, you can, I, I can miss a meeting. You can do it on the, you can do it on the seventh if that works better for everybody, that's fine. I'll, I'll phone it in. Either of those days works for me. Me too. I could do either one. Okay, so to avoid the flood board and, and Hanukkah holidays, should we just, change that to a single meeting combining November and December into December 7th at our normal time. Yes, sounds good. Okay, and if there's, if that works for all of us, that's great. And I think we do have to open it to public comment. Uh, I am not seeing any raised hands and we did not receive any um, emailed public comments regarding this item. Okay. Put that on your calendars so December 7th at 6.30 for our next Park and Rec meeting. And that brings us to item six on the agenda, staff updating commissioner reports. Um, the first sub bullet is director updates. So why don't we let Director Howe do her entire update and at the end of her update, we'll open it for public comment. Sounds good. I've got a long one for you. So I'm gonna try to, to speak a little bit slower cause I tend to rush through it. So bear with me. Um, update on weekly communication outreach. Uh, staff has made 70 calls the week of um, October 19th um, to our senior participants. Uh, no request to be removed from the list this time. Uh, two voicemails on support line asking for assistance for the AFIC Zoom classes, and our intern Perry connected them with Carla for more information. Uh, four greeting cards sent out, two for condolences, one for a birthday, and one for a newborn grandson, and informing callers that the phone number will be changing in the next two weeks. We're going to be going through a two-week transition where we're going to be um, no longer using the AFIC originated phone number, and we're going to be moving um, all of our calls and um, intake for requests to our main community center phone number. That'll just kind of help us go through the, the transition. And originally, Carla had wanted to um, retain that phone number with AFIC as they move to their next location, wherever that might be. Um, Corda Madeira Camp expanded their program into portables. So there was the old portables, which uh, the school refers to as the bungalows that were formerly leased to Twin Cities Child Care. Um, so now there's a total of four rooms at Neil Cummins that we run our um, full, day, full day care at. So we have divided it into um, support for so morning care for, um, for students that are attending Neil Cummins in the afternoon cohorts, the PM cohorts and then afternoon care for those that are attending the AM cohort. 
So we are at max capacity right now um, of two cohorts and using transition areas. And we're still working through some of the kinks with uh, connectivity because we are responsible for uh, doing additional 70 minutes of post school um, virtual or distant learning. So we are working very closely with um, our administrative friends at Neil Cummins and really building those relationships. And I think um, from our weekly calls, it's it's just really laying down the foundation for a really great communication and partnership going forward. So one of the silver linings of going through all these processes. Um, one thing to head to give a heads up with camp is that typically um, camp is offered for holiday breaks. And this year, based on the amount of uh, straight weeks that our staff has been working, they are not gonna be offering holiday camps this year. So we have two more sessions um, until the end of the school year. So three weeks in November and then two weeks in December and our staff is gonna take a little break and recharge and start 2021 uh, fresh and excited to see the kids back again. Uh, dogs and town park feedback we've received from the community, um, including the public comment at the beginning, um, but we've re had a request for goose chasers to return. We've had um, some longtime resident uh, communicate with us that they're, they're unhappy with the quality of cleaning and the mess that comes from our goose friends now that they don't have as many um, uh, deterrents. So, with the um, dogs being on leash, that's less uh, less headache for the ducks and the geese. So the Canadian Canada geese are, are running rampant out there and staff are doing the best that they can. Public Works is out there cleaning the, the sport court and the tennis course areas um, and the pathways a couple times a week. And we've been running athletic classes out on the, um, the basketball court. So it's, it is a challenge. So it's something for the commission to consider going forward, whether we want to do that or whether we want to just Hold on to that for a little bit. I'd hate to see us kind of ruffle, ruffle any human feathers over bringing <laughs> any goose chasers back out there again. And for anyone that's not familiar, there was a Dogs and Vests program that were approved dogs to be off leash to deter the, the Canada geese from getting too comfortable on our, on our fields. Um, ballot box, uh, in case you haven't seen the ballot box, it's right in front of the community center. And I put a Facebook live um, video up for directions as well as some signage on the ground because uh, when people get out and they park at the back of the community center, then uh, they're wondering where to drop it off. And they first see our mailboxes, then they see our office door. And now we've got some arrows that direct them around. So we've seen a lot of good traffic going through and uh, hopefully everyone's getting out there to vote before November 3rd. Public Works uh, project updates. Excited to announce that Skunk Hollow will be done this week. Uh, they're doing minor landscaping um, uh, following this week, and we would love to be able to do a um, ribbon cutting, so a partially in-person and then mostly virtual ribbon cutting the first week in November, um, kind of tentatively thinking on Thursday, November 5th. Uh, maybe at a 4.30 or a 5 o'clock time, doing something very brief, half an hour at most, because um, that is the time change. But the idea is to, to bring in some of our past commissioners, um, Council Member Cassisis, we'd love to have him, him be involved because he's his involvement through the process and the number of years that have gone through. And then um, invite the direct uh, residents, immediate neighbors that have been um, uh, contributing feedback along the process as well and then uh, Facebook Live and possibly YouTube uh, post some videos to include the greater community. So that's what we're thinking on that. Um, let's see. <sighs> um, Halloween and Day of the Dead activities. We've got virtual pumpkin carving contests on Facebook, pet costume contest, collaboration with the library for in-person story time, which is already booking. We've got uh, on Thursday, we've got a four o'clock and a five o'clock and there's um, 14, 14 max people to come in and it's gonna be really great. And it's our first collaboration with the new branch manager at the Corte Madera Library. So that's a great way to start that relationship. Um, if you haven't noticed that if you've dropped off your ballot in the front, we have spooked out our front windows of the community center. And we also included a um, community um, ofrenda. So for Day of the Dead, we've got um, one table in the very center of the lobby, usually the automatic doors that open up that has a display to honor those that are no longer living. Um, so if you, and it's open to the public. So if you want to contribute anything from your family for the community ofrenda, then that's open as well. 
I'm not sure that we've had too much uh, collaboration on that. So we're still welcoming anything else. And the Day of the Dead stuff will be up through the beginning of November. Um, let's see, digital activity guide. We've had two so far. Hopefully you've seen those. We had one issue for October and then one for a combination of October and November. And that's to replace our, our printed activity guide. Since things are still uncertain and very much pared down, it's um, a great way to save some costs as far as production of a printed activity guide and the mailing and everything else that goes into it. And it gives us a lot more control and kind of stretches our wings in the virtual world. And it's definitely something to see us take the next step in technology. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, PSPS preparation, um, our intern Perry and I are working on PSPS. We're working with um, collaborating uh, with our um, neighbors through Marin County, the community centers and making sure that we are prepared and we're creating a media out, outreach. Hopefully after this week, we won't need it. This is our, our week last year where we had the PSPS, but we've got a really great plan already with diagrams of how we would lay out the community center that's um, pandemic uh, approved. And it's just getting that, that next step of getting the communication out to what our residents can expect, say, if power is out for 24 hours, then do this um, or look to this resource and this is what we're gonna do. Um, emergency order on field use and permits. And this is something that, I, that was added after the agenda packet went out um, on Thursday. Um, town of Corte Madeira, town of San Anselmo and city of Larkspur came together and did a unified message and um, emergency use regarding field, um, field use and permits. And this is a catalyst coming from some um, use without permits, disregard for state and county guidelines resulting in an unsafe activity reported um, uh, shelter in place violations to Marin Recovers. Um, for example, two weeks ago on a Sunday, Town Park was used for a large event without permission. They even had a DJ. Um, negative interactions with um, Central Marin Police Authority. Um, there has been some issues out at Piper, Piper Parks with large groups of adults playing soccer or adults doing other adult athletic activities. And um, no athletics for adults has been approved by the state or county for guidance. So it's, um, it's come to make sure that we're really communicating with our residents. And we thought everybody understood and maybe some people understand, but it's really the next step in communicating and make sure that we have bilingual postings um, up at our fields. So all three jurisdictions are doing that. So that's something that supports uh, CMPA as well for their enforcement. And then one future agenda item for the commission to consider is discussing food trucks, um, a food truck day at Menke Park. And that was by Commissioner Avazio. And that is the conclusion of my director's report. Any questions? You're on mute, You're on mute Matt. Matt. Ashley, what do you recommend that we do about the geese? What's your recommendation? I would love to be able to wait a little bit longer and see if we could make sure that our, our challenges and friction is kind of calmed down a little bit with dogs um, and dogs on leash and dogs use to make sure everybody knows what our ordinance is and in the enforcement plan with it before we try to make um, uh, make other plans. So my, my proposal would be to maybe consider bringing the vests back next spring. And Here's around that issue, when I used to actually go to the office back in the East Bay, it's a, a large kind of leafy campus with a pond and there were a lot of geese there. And they would hire a guy to come out periodically with a not too aggressive remote control car, which you can control and doesn't scare the geese quite as much, but it certainly deters them. So that's a possibility. I'm sure we have friends with zones in town, with uh, drones in town as well. Well, that, that would be a whole nother level. <laughs> Any other comments about that or, or other issues that Ashley discussed? Thanks for the update, Ashley. We did receive an email to public comment about this item uh, or one of the items under the director's report. Um, I see that he's on the call at the moment as an attendee, so I don't know if he would prefer to make the comment himself. I, I said I would read it. Um, 
but seeing no, no raised hands, I will read the comment from Kevin Salas. It says, hello, I live on Paloma Drive. There are many children that live in close vicinity to Skunk Hollow. Can we please have a sign that indicates that cars should drive slowly near the park? Is it possible to put a crosswalk on the street as pedestrians approach the park? Thank you for all of your hard work, uh, Kevin and Rachel Salas. Uh, I did respond that um, we would archive the, the comment with um, public comments received, and I also forwarded it to Director Howe and our Public Works Director, RJ Suko. It did, it just came in at 6.54 during the meeting. So um, staff, of course, hasn't had a chance to look at this yet. And I think you're right that that would be, eventually that would be a Public Works decision. And there is the um, four or so preschools or daycares that are right near there as well. So I think there's definitely um, an awareness of young children in that area, but I think public works would have to make the decision about off park signage and crosswalks, things like that. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, next item under um, Number six on the agenda is commissioner reports. So the first one is updates from the recent town council meetings. Um, I have on the agenda here that Commissioner Ravazio was scheduled for October. So I don't know if you or others have any info from recent uh, town council meetings. Well, I do sit through them all. Um, and there has been some ongoing discussion and input from the public regarding dogs in the park. Um, but other than that, the only really great news parks and recreation wise that um, I can think of other than Skunk Hollow Park is the new uh, bike paths that are going in really quickly over on Redwood Highway between Macy's all the way up to the Nellan Undercrossing. And I saw kids riding home from school. I think they were coming home from school and they were so thrilled to be on a smooth path that's not beat up with tree roots. So made me feel really proud to be in a town that was still able to invest in these kinds of infrastructure improvements for bike. So go Corte Madera, great job. Yeah, my dad who is 80 and rides his bike all the time said it's been very smooth and he appreciated it. You're good. Okay. Um, and then the executive advisory committee did not meet since the last me meeting. Um, the next item is the town park master plan committee. Um, do you folks have any progress update on that issue? Yes, that's me. <laughs> we, uh, we had a very productive session meeting um, the subcommittee with Ashley and Rebecca and Commissioner Phipps husband, uh, Dan Phipps, who is an architect who's agreed to help us do some early concepting to try to solve for some of the challenges that we have with the community center and the immediate needs that uh, Director Howe has in terms of classroom space, storage, managing through the, the COVID um, restrictions and requirements and getting us to a place where we can really optimize the, that building uh, and that footprint. So we're in the very early stages of some um, some broad scale uh, concepting that will include some of the things that Director Howe has already been exploring, like what well, uh, portables or new space that would be adjacent. So we will be coming back to this group with something a little bit more concrete, um, probably a, a couple of uh, meetings from now, maybe in, in the new year. Our next most immediate uh, Thing that we need to attack is getting community input on all of the different ideas that we have generated and to ensure that we understand what the community is most interested in having us pursue and that we haven't uh, left anything off of the list of possible uh, expansions to either the infrastructure or the programs that we offer. So we're looking to use the, the uh, survey that was done back in, I think it was 2007 or 2009 and use that as our baseline because we do have benchmark data there. So we wanna to try to get a hold of that survey instrument and see if we need to make any modifications to it and then refield that survey, hopefully before the end of the year.
Great, thank you, Commissioner Brown, for the update. Any comments or questions from other commissioners? I would just like to add that I did look into, I've, I've attempted to contact these uh, providers of really high quality permanent modular structures um, that work primarily in residential, but our, our architect Dan said that there would be no problem in using those kind of really beautiful uh, structures instead of the typical, you know, sort of classroom portable. Um, but the only problem is they're so busy, they're getting so many requests, it's such a good, there's Blue Homes and there's another one who's sort of a, a knockoff of Blue Homes that's really highly recommended. They're really sustainable, good quality, well-sourced, fair trade, the whole thing. Um, and they're so busy that they're not even returning my calls. I did get, I did get one conversation in, but I think if, if, Ashley, if you really want to start looking into that, we should get RJ on it because they'll respond to the town of Corte Madera more than, you know, a Parks and Rec commissioner calling with an inquiry. So they, 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 they said they were gonna send me some prices, but um, I'm not holding my breath because uh, it's a lot of work, but um, they really can do just these big open shells with good storage, add bathrooms, uh, make it so that it's modular and you can divide it in the middle. So they were definitely saying they could do it all, but um, the price and you know how to make it happen is a whole nother story. Well, yeah. um, just to say um, update from the architect, he's in the process of getting um, the as belts and really putting together all of your input from Ashley and everyone to conceptualize um, a plan that includes, you know, everyone's needs and um, is on a timeline in terms of short term and long term goals. So it's in the works. And thank you again to Dan because he is doing this on a volunteer basis and he's really uh, given us some good quality recommendations at the outset and I have a high faith in what he's going to come back with. I think that would be really helpful if we do want Director Howe or RJ to look into that, that, that they have a little bit of specificity in the request that they make to a company so they know at least sort of what, what, the, uh, what the guidelines are that we're looking for. Okay, any other comments or questions on the master plan? Okay, that just brings us to individual commissioner updates. If anyone has anything to bring up in their own interaction or experience with the town of Parks and Rec, then, then please do. I just have I one little start. thing to report. Oh, sorry, was somebody else going? No, no, please go ahead. Oh. Um, one little thing to report that we're working on and, and may be uh, coming to Parks and Rec for support and or money. Um, well, money is really the only support that they need. So Cafe Verde is trying to um, find a way to cover the trellised area outside of the restaurant, which is actually on, you know, that's park property there. That town park plaza is park property and the trellis is owned by the town and what he what they would love to do is put a both a rain and sunproof kind of fabric they literally just staple it into the wood and cover the whole thing so that once the rain start and even for better sun uh, sunshade protection um, that it would be covered and that the uh, the trumpet vines that are growing would still be able to grow on top of the cloth whatever the cloth is so we did have somebody come out and, and uh, take some measurements and they're gonna get us an estimate. And I just wanted you guys to know since it's Parkland that you know, Cafe Verde is kind of exploring that. Um, they, he, uh, I think uh, Tony talked to Todd and Todd was, seemed fine with it. But I think it probably will need to go like to the community foundation and others who were involved in, in building the shade structure to make sure that it's something that people would like to see happen. 
I wonder if, as we're exploring that, if we should be looking at ways to potentially provide shade and rain um, coverage that doesn't interfere with the trellis, because those the trumpet vines and fabric seem to me to be sort of incompatible for the long haul. I understand trying to put the fabric underneath the trumpet vines so they can grow over it, but I just wonder mm -hmm. if there are other areas of that plaza that we could cover conceivably where they have the um, the cafe seating cafe tables and chairs, and even on the other side of the trellis as well. Maybe the whole um, patio doesn't need to be covered and we don't need to compete with the trellis. Just we, did, we did look at a couple things and there are some things you can do. You can attach sailcloths to the trellis, but then draw them over to the outdoor seating area and actually attach them like a triangular one, attach it to the building. Um, that's a an in, fairly inexpensive solution a more expensive solution that I don't think we can afford is to do one really nice, large, retractable awning right off of the building going straight out over the eating area. So it's not, it's not interfering with the trellis. The trellis was sort of settled on by, I don't know, just the three of us who were there because it was probably the least expensive thing we can make do to make it work. But I agree if you do it and kill the trumpet vine, that's not a good idea. So it would only be done if we could get the arborists to agree that it's a good long-term solution for the trumpet vine. Or maybe it's just some sailcloths, you know, maybe it's sailcloths attached artfully. You know, you've seen them, the, the restaurants do these things where they're sort of angled and... Um, I suggest since that is on park property and falls under the guise of Parks and Rec Commission, and if they were to do something like that, I imagine it would go in front of town council that we should probably put this item on the agenda for December, what did we decide on? December 7th. And as yeah, we all know- I'm not gonna, happened. I'm not gonna be there though, but I can turn over, I can turn every, anything over to that, Louise that's what or somebody else. Suggest, is any information you have would be helpful because we know from, for instance, doing the shade structure at the playground, that if we didn't have a lot of progress before a meeting, then nothing ever gets decided. So mm -hmm. the more info we have before December 7th, um, the closer we can get to perhaps helping this process along. And if it's something that, that we in the town wants to do and potentially have rain protection out there for outdoor COVID dining, um, we would have to move pretty quickly to get that done before spring. So right. um, well, anything what, you can one bring. Of the thing one of the things that stimulated it was that there's money available, that there, the town got sort of, I guess maybe Rebecca can explain more or Ashley, they got some grant money that is specifically for providing safe, COVID safe outdoor dining or outdoor recreation space. I don't know if Ashley has any details on that or not. Okay. To to Rebecca. I don't have any details. Um, I know that uh, our public works director, RJ Suko, was, was talking about that and possibly bringing something to council about matching funds, um, but that hasn't come before council yet. Um, okay. I don't know how much funding is available, mm -hmm. but yes, that is, that is correct. There are grant funds available to put toward this town-wide. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can send a text and see if I can get you a response before the end of the, your meeting. A response regarding whether or not funds are available? Uh, or how much? No, how much yeah, no, funds? no, I, well. But no, yes, I, you're I, correct, yeah, there are funds available. Um, I don't know what the process would be for expending yeah. the funds at this point. And, and you know, we might not make the beginning of whatever kind of rainy season we're gonna have, mm -hmm. but you know, this whole thing isn't going anywhere. So even in terms of providing shade, uh, in the in the fair weather months, um, you know, I don't I don't think we need to be under any urgent rush to make this happen. I think we want to do it right, um, but we do. I, I I'm hoping that um, there's support for doing it because people need outdoor places to gather and uh, safely. Okay, well let's let's bring it up again in December with as much info as we have at that time and. Okay. Um, I think it's a great idea, but since it's not on the agenda, I don't think we should go too far down debating the pros and cons of it um, without people knowing about our discussion. So, okay. Thanks for Thank bringing you. it up. That's a great, Thank great you. idea.
Uh, just a, a plug for our mayor and town manager community chats, which are the second and fourth Tuesdays. There is one scheduled for tomorrow at four o'clock if you um, want to jump on and ask your, your question to town, um, get a more, more detailed answer. Great. And are there any other individual commissioner updates? Um, the thing I was going to mention at the beginning is just that I, I love the decorations at the community center. My daughter loves them. It looks awesome. Good. Thank you for visiting. I will let our team know. Brian and Christina put a bunch of effort out there. They they love that stuff. Really awesome. Creepy. I'd like to say how wonderful it is to have the playground open. <laughs> Good. People seem to be, you know, behaving well and doing the right thing. I've heard of a couple altercations, but for the most part, everybody is just happy to be there and wearing their mask and, you know, I've never seen kids play so hard in my life. Get those calluses back. <laughs> Any other commissioner updates? Okay. Um, item seven on the agenda is routine and other matters. And the typical October discussion is around fee resolution. And in the past, as you've all know, we've, we've had um, extensive research and discussions about fee resolutions. This year is a little different. There is no proposed changes and um, everything is remaining in place. Um, we're welcome to discuss the fact that everything's staying as it was, but I think we have maybe a little less discussion than we did in past years. I just had two questions. Um, having not been through this uh, discussion in the past, I wondered if Skunk Hollow should be included on there as a possible site for people to reserve and use for private events, birthday parties, picnics, et cetera. I don't know if that's um, something that was considered when Skunk Hollow was being developed, but it's not included in the fee schedule. So that was one question. Um, my second question was why the call out about age friendly intergenerational center, specifically the residents um, only being uh, included if they lived in Corte Madera, whereas the prior element of the resolution includes people who live in Larkspur as well. So if I could just understand that. I can't speak to that since that wasn't the last one, but it's also kind of irre irrelevant at this point since they're not at the community center um, and if they're not running through the community center, but I didn't want to make any changes at all to it. Cause I just, I feel like 2020 is a year of pause um, and kind of let, let everything settle in and then um, maybe dig into it a little bit more for the next year. Uh, related to your skunk hollow um, prior to me uh, taking this position, reviewing some of the um, aired uh, commission meetings. I believe there was a bunch of um, public comments during the playground consideration and the renovation about the concern for having more rentals there and really the the desire to keep it a neighborhood park. Um, but it, I please defer to the, the commissioners that were on the commission at that time. I think I have a recollection that many parks are excluded for rentals. That is correct. I was just okay. going to reiterate that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we did discuss that in, in that was definitely the reason because it was a mini park that was meant for primarily people who are walking or maybe driving to the park. And one thing that we didn't hear was that there were a lot of large groups using the park or there were ever really competition for facilities there. But I do think if perhaps after the park is redone and it gets a little bit more attention, well, we should definitely keep our eye and see whether or not it's crowded to the point that might be required even with local folks using it. Thanks. Anything else on the fee resolution issues? No, I can speak to the Corte Madera Intergenerational Center item. Um, I believe that was because the, um, the group that ran the Age Friendly Intergenerational Center, um, the town was subsidizing a portion of it under our sales tax override uh, for that was meant for youth and senior activities. So to compensate for that, um, 
to allow more of the benefit to go to Puerto Madera residents, the, the Age Friendly Immigration Center offered a discounted annual pass for residents of Puerto Madera that they did not extend to um, residents of other nearby cities. But again, that point is, is moot now that the, the center isn't um, operating out of the community center. Okay, thank you. And that is the end of our agenda, if there's nothing else. And we neglected to do this last month, but we, we meant to adjourn in the memory of, of Jackie Branch, who was the town parks and rec director for a number of years and an employee of the town for 38 years. Um, she passed away on August 29th, 2020. And so we wanted to dedicate this meeting um, to her and adjourn until the next regular meeting, which is now December 7th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>